Hello, and welcome to Mesoblast 2020 Full Year Financial Results and Corporate Highlights webcast. An announcement and presentation have been lodged with the ASX and are also available on the Home and Investors pages at www.mesoblast.com. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session, and instructions will follow at that time. As a reminder, this conference call is being recorded. Before we begin, let me remind you that during today's conference call, the company will be making forward-looking statements that represent the company's intentions, expectations, or beliefs concerning future events. These forward-looking statements are qualified by important factors set forth in today's announcement and the company's filing with the SEC which could cause actual results to differ materially from those and such forward-looking statements. In addition, any forward-looking statements represent the company's views only as of the date of this webcast and should not be relied upon as representing the company's views of any subsequent date. The company specifically disclaims any obligations to update such statements. With that, I would now like to hand the call over to Dr. Silvio Atescu, Chief Executive of Mesoblast. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon and good morning to everybody. Um, to the um, uh, call on uh, the operational and financial highlights for the year ended June 30th, 2020. It's been a tremendous year, very important year for Mesoblast, and the next few months are certainly going to be transformational for the company. Uh, if we could go to slide four of the presentation, please. The um, allergenic cellular medicines that we're developing are based on three pillars. We have an innovative technology platform. We have a very clearly defined lead product candidate, and we have a number of phase three product candidates that will have short-term readouts. In terms of our innovative technology platform, um, we uh, have a well-characterized immunomodulatory mechanism of action. We're targeting severe and life-threatening conditions and the technology is underpinned by an extensive and global intellectual property estate. Our lead product candidate is Fryoncil. It has a targeted uh, market. If approved, the launch for this product is planned in 2020. Um, it has uh, been filed with the FDA for, uh, uh, for pediatric steroid refractory acute GVHD and is currently undergoing um, the final stages of the review process under a priority review. We have a PDUFA date for September 30th, and we have industrial-scale manufacturing in place to meet the commercial demand uh, as we expect to move forward. In addition, we have well-established plans for life cycle expansion of Remy stem cell in pediatric and adult inflammatory diseases. We have a phase three trial ongoing in patients with acute respiratory distress syndrome from COVID-19, and we have two additional product candidates in phase three trials for heart failure and back pain with near-term U.S. readouts. We could move to the next slide. Slide five shows the platform technology mechanism of action. The cells that we're developing, mesenchymal lineage cells, uh, are found uh, in every vascularized tissue around blood vessels they express a number of receptors for various inflammatory cytokines, including TNF-alpha receptor, IL-1 receptor, IL-6 receptor, interferon gamma receptor. So when they find themselves in the middle of a cytokine storm, they're able to be activated, and they respond by releasing a, a variety of anti-inflammatory mediators that switch off the severe inflammatory response by, by regulating and controlling multiple arms of the immune system that are responsible for the damage to tissues um, that are, are the basis of the diseases that we are targeting. If we go to the next slide, slide six. This slide summarizes the, the clinical programs and the advanced stage of development of our product candidates. Remy Stem Cell is our most advanced product candidate. It's being developed for pediatric and adult systemic inflammatory conditions. And as you can see, um, the most advanced indication is for pediatric acute 
posterior refractory graft versus host disease. It is also being developed for adult um, posterior refractory acute GVHD, chronic GVHD, and is in the midst of phase three for acute respiratory distress syndrome caused by COVID-19. It's also being developed for biologic refractory Crohn's disease. Our products for localized inflammatory diseases include Revascor, based on Rex Lemmy's Strosol platform, and MPCO 6 id on the same platform. These products are in phase three and will have readouts during the upcoming quarter for heart failure and for chronic low back pain. Go to the next slide, please, slide seven. This slide summarizes our commercial scale manufacturing capabilities. We have a scalable allogeneic platform technology that we call off the shelf. The manufacturing capabilities meet stringent criteria of the international regulatory agencies we are working with. The processes meet robust quality assurance with final product consistency and reproducibility. We have sufficient capacity to meet our Ryan Hill GVHD launch plans, and we have the ability to increase and plans in underway to increase our capacity requirements for our maturing pipeline, including for GVHD label extensions and for COVID-19 ARDS program. The basis for our ability to increase our capacity lies in our proprietary xeno-free technologies, which will allow us to increase yield and output, and our ability to move to three-dimensional bioreactors to reduce the labor costs and improve manufacturing efficiencies. These innovations will significantly reduce our cost of goods. On the next slide, we depict the, the most important aspect that underpins the value chain for Mesoblast, our global IP estate. This is an extensive patent portfolio with protection extending through 2040 in all major markets. We have over 1,100 patents and patent applications that cover compositions of matter, manufacturing, and therapeutic applications of mesenchymal in each cells. These patents provide us with very strong global protection in areas of our core commercial focus. But when outside of our core commercial areas, we will grant rights to third parties who require access to our patent portfolio to commercialize their products. An example of this is our relationship with Tygenix, a wholly owned subsidiary of Takeda, who, from whom we receive royalty income for the treatment of complex perianal fistulae in adult patients with Crohn's disease, as well as milestone payments. So let me move to the recent highlights. On slide nine, Remy Stem Cell for Children is a major objective and has, has achieved some very important highlights. Very recently, we had a successful um, meeting with the FDA Oncologic Drugs Advisory Committee, ODAC, who voted overwhelmingly, nine to one, in favor that the availability, available data support the efficacy of Ryan cell in pediatric patients with refractory acute graft versus host disease. The biologics license application for Ryan cell is under priority review by the FDA, and we have an action date of September 30th under the Prescription Drug User Fee Act, the PDUFA. If approved by the PDUFA date, we plan to launch Rhinesil during the fourth quarter in children and adolescents up to 18 years old. Preparations are very advanced for our potential launch with product inventory and commercial team in place. A second major opportunity and, and, and uh, plan is to use uh, Remy stem cell in children with COVID-19 multi-system inflammatory syndrome, or MIS-C. We have established an expanded access program in the U.S. for compassionate use of Remy stem cell in the treatment of COVID-19 infected children with cardiovascular and other complications of MIS-C, a life-threatening disease. The first patient has received treatment under the EAP and has been discharged from the hospital. We will continue to monitor all patients who received this treatment for this severe life-threatening condition. Next, let's look at the recent highlights for Remy stem cell in adults, slide 10. The FDA cleared an IND application to treat patients with COVID-19 acute respiratory distress syndrome 
providing a pathway for use under both EAP and in a randomized controlled trial. Under the emergency compassionate care at Mount Sinai Hospital earlier this year in New York, 75% of patients with moderate to severe ventilator dependence, ARDS, who received two infusions of Remy stem cell, were successfully taken off the ventilator and discharged from hospital within a median of 10 days. As a result of that positive pilot data, we initiated a phase three trial, um, randomized placebo control of Remy stem cell in up to 300 ventilator dependent patients with moderate to severe COVID-19 respiratory distress syndrome with an objective to reduce the mortality rate within 30 days. The trial is enrolling well and and is expected to complete recruitment during the fourth quarter of this year. In the meantime, an independent data safety monitoring board has set a review date of early September for the first interim analysis of the phase three trial from the first 90 patients um, after they've completed 30 days of follow-up. And we will, of course, update the market as we receive that interim analysis. In addition, we have plans to move forward in adults with steroid refractory acute graft host disease. These patients with the most severe forms of the disease continue to have a high unmet need and poor survival. Just this month, we convened an advisory meeting with key opinion leaders to develop a clinical trial design for a post-market study evaluating the stem cell in these high-risk patients. And now I'd like to ask our Chief Financial Officer, Josh Muntner, to take you through the financials. Josh? Thanks, Sylvia. That was a terrific review of our recent highlights and some of the important activities at Mesoblast. Turning to the financials, slide 12. Slide 12 includes highlights from our income statement, where we see growth in revenue and reduction in our operating loss for our fiscal year ended June 30, 2020. Total revenue grew by nearly 100% to $32.2 million from $16.7 million. The key components of total revenue are milestone revenue and commercialization revenue. Milestone revenue from our strategic partnerships grew 127% in fiscal 2020 to $25 million from $11 million a year earlier. The milestone revenue reflects a $15 million upfront payment from Grunenthal received um, as part of the partnership we established with them, and also recognizes $10 million in revenue from our license agreement with TASLI. Commercialization revenue, which is royalty revenue collected from JCR Pharmaceuticals from their product Temcel, grew 32% in the period over period comparison, growing to 6.6 million for fiscal 2020 from 5 million for the year earlier period. Regarding non-revenue highlights, we had a 13% reduction in loss after tax. The reduction in loss after tax was partially driven by the increased revenue, but also reduced spend on our clinical trials. The impact of the reduced spending on clinical trials was offset by significant investments we've been making in manufacturing and building out the commercial team in anticipation of a near-term launch. Slide 13. In slide 13, we review our relationship with JCR Pharmaceuticals a Japanese company focused on commercializing products for rare and orphan disease markets in Japan. JCR has exclusive rights to our MSC technology for acute GBHD in Japan, which they commercialize as Temcel. They introduced the product in 2016 and steadily grew sales in Japan, which led to a consistently rising royalty paid to us. As shown on the chart on the right, during our fiscal the year ended June 30, 2020, we recognized $6.6 million of royalty revenue. This is 32% higher, as I noted, than the year earlier period. I'd be remiss if I didn't note that when compared to the trailing 12-month period, that ended March 31, 2020, the royalty we received declined a little bit by about 13%. The decline was actually driven by outstanding success that Temcel has had since its launch as JCR Pharma has encountered some product supply issues. In fact, JCR has stated that they have taken steps to increase production capacity for Temcel as they have received orders far in excess of their initial forecasts. 
We're pleased to see the continued demand for Temcel and believe it bodes well for our product if approved. As noted on slide 13, the addressable U.S. market for acute GVHD in children and adults is approximately eight times larger in the U.S. and Japan. This is driven by population size differences, incidence rates, as well as pharmacoeconomics uh, differences between the two countries. We continue to benefit from our relationship with JCR, and we look forward to their planned increase in capacity in order to meet patient demand in Japan. Moving to slide 14, we find the entire income statement for the year ended June 30, 2020. I've already covered the growth seen when comparing 2020 to 2019, but want to reiterate the reduction in loss after tax. Despite the significant investment we're making in commercial readiness for potential U.S. launch of Ryansa. Finally, on slide 15, I'd like to mention one of the most important items on our balance sheet, which is our cash position. Cash on hand at June 30, 2020 was $129.3 million. We raised $90 million in May 2020 from existing and new institutional investors. The proceeds from the offering will be used for commercial launch of Ryanso for acute GVHD. We'll also support our scale-up of manufacturing for our maturing pipeline, including GVHD label extensions and for COVID-19 arts, and also support the clinical programs underlying those. In addition to our cash position, up to an additional $67.5 million may be available through existing strategic partnerships and our ongoing financing facilities over the next 12 months. We believe that our cash and available cash positions us well as we look forward to transitioning to a commercial organization with our own product sales. Additional information regarding the company and our financial results have been posted to the ASX and the SEC as well as their website. I'd like to hand the call back to Sylvia now to review our operational and corporate habits. Thank you, Josh. We can now move to slide number 17. I'll, I'll talk about uh, our programs and, and uh, various various other product highlights. Acute growth versus host disease is a serious and fatal complication of an allogeneic bone marrow transplant. It's, it's considered in three phases. Phase one is the host tissue damage that occurs following bone marrow transplant conditioning. Phase two is the immune cell activation and the cytokine storm that ensues. The cytokine storm is a very important component because it's the cytokines that ultimately result in tissue destruction, which is phase three, the inflammation and end organ damage of the skin, the gut, and the liver. Next slide, please. Children with steroid refractory acute graphic host disease are particularly high risk of treatment failure and death because there is no nothing approved in children under 12. More than 2,000 allogeneic bone marrow transplants are performed annually in children and adolescents in the U.S. Despite prophylaxis, 50% will develop acute graphic host disease. First-line treatment is with steroids, but more than 50% of patients will be refractory and fail to respond to steroids. And as I said, children under 12 have no approved treatments. Acute graft versus host disease primarily affects skin, gut, and liver. The, you can detect uh, the, the problems through large volumes of diarrhea, through increasing levels of bilirubin. And when you start to get gut and liver disease, the mortality approaches 90% when involving these organs. Next slide, please. The immunomodulatory activities of Remy stem cell are highlighted in this particular slide. When the inflammatory cytokines from a cytokine storm produced by cells called M1 macrophages or T cells uh, are, are, are in, in, in train, and you put Remy stem cell in that microenvironment, the receptors on Remy stem cells, such as TNF alpha receptor, TNFR1, is activated, resulting in the cell's ability to respond, secreting factors that then turn off these damaging cytokines or switch off the inflammatory cells that produce these cytokines, notably the macrophages and the T cells. Ultimately, next slide, the outcome is a, is a responder rate, a response rate, 
that translates into a switching off of the disease itself and improvement in clinical outcomes. We call that the day 28 overall response. The importance of the day 28 response, which was the primary endpoint of the phase three trial, is that it's a surrogate and a predictor of overall survival. What you can see here on this slide, on the left-hand side, in red, is a recent publication, 2020, from Macmillan et al., who show the current standard, best standard of care and survival outcomes in children with steroid refractory acute carotid host disease. As you can see, the survival outcomes are very dismal. At six months, only 49% of patients are alive. By two years, 35% are alive. In contrast, if you can see the figure on the right, is the survival outcome in the phase three trial of Remy stem cell study 001, where at six months, we had a 69% overall survival. So not only did this study achieve its primary endpoint of day 28 overall response successfully, but when you look at the overall survival, which is really what counts, you see that at, at a six-month time point, we have 20% absolute increase in children who are alive compared to the best available standard of care that's out there today. That means for every 100 children who receive treatment with remi stem cell, 20 would survive who otherwise would have died. Next slide, please. Slide 21. So what is our anticipated FDA approval and plan for Ryan cell? The results from, uh, that from Ryan cell demonstrated consistent outcomes across three distinct trials. The phase three trial that I've just referenced, um, a prior, uh, 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 prior expanded access program in 241 children, with the majority of whom had severe grade CD disease, um, and a, an earlier randomized control trial in children that also demonstrated significant benefit. Looking at these three consistent outcomes was the basis of the uh, BLA that was filed with the FDA. The recent ODAC meeting with the FDA voted overwhelmingly in favor, nine to one, that the available data support the efficacy of Remy stem cell in pediatric patients with steroid refractory acute GVHD. And the FDA has set a prescription drug user fee act, PDUFA action date of September 30th, by which uh, they need to give us uh, a decision. If approved, Ryan cell is planned to be launched during the fourth quarter of this year. In the next slide, um, we we'll summarize here the regulatory and commercial strategy for the launch. Um, much of this strategy has been informed by the success of Temcel in Japan. The FDA PDUFA date, as I said, is September 30th, and in order to be prepared for potential approval, our commercial strategy has put in place uh, an inventory build and an efficient targeted sales force uh, that, that is prepared, well prepared for the potential approval. Um, 15 centers account for about 50% of the transplant patients across the U.S., and so we believe that our targeted sales force will clearly meet that capability. Uh, in addition, beyond approval, we have plans for label extension in the treatment of adult steroid refractory GVHD, and we have beyond that a, a, a very fulsome life cycle strategy for the product. Um, in terms of the post-marketing study in adults, we plan to utilize Remy stem cell manufactured using an optimized manufacturing process, the same process that, that went into the successful phase three trial in children with acute uh, steroid refractory GVHD. We had convened uh, an expert panel just several weeks ago um, to discuss the clinical trial protocol and endpoints. Uh, and currently we have a plan underway for a randomized control trial uh, of Remy stem cell versus standard of care in the high-risk steroid refractory adult patients designed to demonstrate improved overall response and survival and with a focus on those adults who have a continued high met need despite approved therapies who have not responded to existing therapies. Slide 24 shows the more fulsome 
life cycle extension strategy for Remy stem cell beyond the initial pediatric acute GVHD uh, launch. And note that very shortly thereafter, we have plans for the launch, if positive, of COVID-19 in ARDS, which takes us to the next slide. The, let me tell you a little bit about our potential new treatment paradigm in adults and children with COVID-19. Very important focus for the company, as it should be during this, this uh, dreadful pandemic. Slide 26, please. COVID-19 is a respiratory virus with a very high mortality rate due to severe inflammatory inflammation of the lungs a, 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 a disease called acute respiratory disease syndrome, ARDS. ARDS is caused by a cytokine storm in the lungs in these patients. It's an exuberant immune response to the virus. The extensive safety data of Remy stem cell and its anti-inflammatory effects in the setting of acute graphosis disease makes a compelling rationale for evaluating Remy stem cell in COVID-19 ARDS, a disease that is, that is driven by a similar cytokine storm as acute GVHD. In addition, we know that intravenous in, infusion of Remy stem cell results in selective migration and homing to the lungs, making inflammatory lung disease an ideal target for this therapy. So we believe that Remy stem cell has the potential to tame the cytokine storm in ARDS and may offer a life-saving treatment in those patients suffering with COVID-19 disease. The next slide is a complex slide, and I think really there's just a couple of take-home points from this. Firstly, the, that the pathophysiology of ARDS is complex, driven by immune disease, immune inflammation, ultimately results in, in fluid uh, filling up the, the sacs of the lungs, cell death, and influx of inflammatory cells. This is a disease that is well established and not and, and well established in as a cause um, by other viruses and bacteria including influenza so it's a disease well beyond COVID-19 with mortality rates anywhere between 40 to 80 percent a very very important unmet need today um, that we are now addressing so on slide 28 what makes us think that our approach is going to work. Well, we've seen promising pilot data in ventilator-dependent patients with COVID-19 ARDS. In a compassionate use program under an emergency IND earlier this year at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, 12 patients with moderate or severe ARDS received two infusions of Remy stem cell um, within five days. Nine of these 12 patients successfully came on ventilator support at a median of 10 days and were discharged from hospital. At the time, this contrasted substantially with what was being seen in the, in, in the rest of the patients in that city, where only about 9% of COVID-19 ventilated patients were able to be extubated, and a survival rate that, that was of the order of 12% through 30 days. These pilot data informed the design of the ongoing 300 patient randomized controlled clinical trial our objective, of course, being to demonstrate in a randomized way that the therapeutic benefit that we saw in the pilot would, would be confirmed. And a trial that is sufficiently powered to support FDA approval if the results are positive. Slide 29, please. The primary endpoint is all-cause mortality through, at 30 days, with the key secondary endpoint being patients alive off the ventilator within 60 days. Recruitment is expected to complete during Q4, with several interim analyses being planned, which could result in early stoppage for efficacy or futility. But what are the key milestones for Remy stem cell in COVID ARDS? Slide 30. The interim analysis, um, the first interim analysis is due in early September, it's imminent, after 30% of patients have reached the primary endpoint. Once the full trial reads out, or earlier if results support, we will seek expedited regulatory approval subject to positive results. In, in, the, 
in parallel. We are manufacturing scale-up to meet the projected increase in capacity requirements should the results be positive. We are able to implement proprietary xeno-free technologies and we certainly have plans to move into 3D bioreactors to allow us to have sufficient capability to meet this large unmet need. In addition, we are in discussions with uh, various potential partners to support manufacturing and commercialization plans. What about Remy Stem cell food? children with COVID-19. Slide 31. Children hospitalized with COVID-19 develop both ARDS and a life-threatening inflammation called multi-system inflammatory syndrome, or MIS-C, which involves multiple critical organs in their vasculature. In approximately 50% of cases, this disease is associated with significant cardiovascular complications that directly involve the heart muscle and may result in reduced cardiac function and can be fatal. These children often show no evidence of active infection, but have been infected and have antibodies against COVID-19, which suggests an autoimmune process as, as the primary cause. Mesoblast has established an expanded access program with the FDA, which provides physicians with access to Remy stem cell in these patients in children aged two months to 17 years with heart disease as a complication of MIS-C. The first patient has received treatment under the EAP and has been discharged from the hospital. Mesoblast will continue to monitor the outcome of this first child as well as all children with MIS-C treated under the EAP in order to establish the safety and effectiveness of the protocol in children with this potentially life-threatening complication of the disease. Now let me move on and give you updates on our other phase three candidates, heart failure and chronic low back pain. Slide 33, please. Both of these product candidates are in established partnerships under regional uh, relationships. MPCO6ID is our product candidate for inflammatory intervertebral disc disease. We have a partnership with Gruenthal that covers Europe and Latin America uh, and subject to positive readouts. Um, we, we are able to, uh, we will be leveraging uh, the, the strength of the partnership in terms of um, sales marketing distribution uh, and in, in the regions with, of the partnership. With respect to Revascal for Heart Failure, we have a regional partnership in China with Tasley, and again, subject to positive readouts, um, that partnership is, is likely to deliver a substantial distribution channel in a very large market opportunity. Slide 34. Revascal for advanced and end-stage heart failure. In December 2019, um, the, the, the trial surpassed the number of primary endpoints required for trial completion. Um, we've all, all study visits have completed during the course of the year. Uh, there was, there's been ongoing quality review of all data completed at the study sites. There was a delay of about a quarter in accessing the data due to COVID-19 related issues. Um, all, all of that has now been completed and, and uh, data readout is expected during the fourth quarter of this year. The results may support regulatory approval in the US. In March, results from a sub-study of 70 patients with end-stage ischemic heart failure and a left ventricular assist device um, were presented at the American College of Cardiology scientific sessions. The results from that sub-study of 159 randomized patients were that the, that the MPCs had a beneficial effect on the ability to wean off an LVAD, reduction in major mucosal bleeding, and readmissions uh, in these heart failure patients. Importantly, the end-stage ischemic heart failure patients with LVADs are older and have comorbidities such as diabetes and closely resemble the majority of patients in our 566 patient phase three trial in advanced chronic heart failure. Let's move on to our back pain phase three trial, slide 35. This phase three trial of MPCO6ID for chronic low back pain in 404 patients also has completed all study visits Ongoing quality review of all data has been completed at the study sites. 
Again, there was a delay of about a quarter due to COVID-19 related uh, restrictions and the data readout is expected in the fourth quarter of this year. We continue to have excellent operational progress with our strategic partner Grunthal. Uh, in Grunthal in Europe will complete clinical protocol design, regulatory input and receive clearance from the European regulated, regulatory authorities to begin a second trial in Europe. Um, and those those plans are all underway uh, and, and meetings have been held for the European regulators. Results from both trials, the US trial and the European trial, will be considered pivotal to support regulatory approvals in, in both the US and Europe. And finally, slide 36 are the major operational milestones that we expect to see in the next 12 months. Many of these are actually um, in, in, the, in a very short short period of time. Remy Stem Cell for Acute GBHD, uh, as I've mentioned several times, it's under priority review with a PDUFA date set for September 30th. If approved, we have a whole plan in, in, in place for the U.S. launch plan for later this year. Beyond that, of course, we, as I said, we will initiate a study in adults um, with refractory steroid refractory GBHD in order to expand the label. For acute respiratory distress syndrome, the ongoing recruitment Phase three trial of Remy stem cell is ongoing. The trial completion is expected during the fourth quarter, and we assume that we will be establishing a strategic partnership for manufacturing and commercialization for this indication. Revascal for advanced and end-stage heart failure, the data readout, as I've mentioned, is in the next quarter, and we will initiate a confirmatory trial in end-stage heart failure subject to the result readout. Finally, for chronic low back pain, again, the data readout for the phase three trial is in the next quarter, and we expect to obtain clearance from the European regulatory authorities shortly to begin a European phase three trial. And on that note, I, I'd like to thank you for listening to this presentation, to open it up for questions. And in addition to myself and uh, Josh Mundner, I'd like to introduce also our uh, chief medical officer, Dr. Fred Grossman, who is with us to answer any any appropriate questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you wish to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. If you wish to cancel your request, please press star 2. If you're on a speakerphone, please pick up the handset to ask your question. To allow everyone an opportunity to participate, we ask that questions are limited to one with a follow-up. Your first question comes from Louise Chen with Cantor. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you for taking my question and follow up here. So my question for you is how should we think about modeling fiscal year 2021? It looks like there's a lot of moving parts. So how should we think about the sales progression for our council assuming approval? Any milestones that you expect if the chronic low back pain and heart failure data are positive? and then SG&A and R&D expense in 2021 versus what we saw in fiscal 2020. Thank you. Um, thanks, Louise. Those are a lot of questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry. So, so we, we, of course, have a planned um, trajectory for sales of Rionsil. I think a lot of that obviously depends on agreements with payers uh, around pricing and reimbursement. Um, and those discussions are actively ongoing by our commercial team. Uh, they, the, the pricing and reimbursement details, of course, will be in place uh, after the product launch um, as, as required. But um, really the most important way to look at this is, is lessons learned from the, 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 the TEM cell experience in Japan. So in, in Japan... The um, reimbursement based on pharmacoeconomics and the healthcare costs is, you know, sort of as, as a rule of thumb for most drugs of the order of, say, 50% of what one would expect to see in the U.S. And having, having seen that uh, and having seen the market adoption that has occurred in the last three years uh, in, in Japan, which has ultimately resulted in the requirement for, for JCR to expand their manufacturing capabilities, in other words, they underestimated the, the demand. Um, putting those two together um, gives us pretty clear line of sight around how we see the, the, the rollout and the revenue 
generation and the number of patients that are likely to, to adopt um, this treatment for, for which, if we get approval, uh, will be the only approved therapy for children under 12. So I, I, I'm not sure how specific I can be beyond that, but I think that's, that's the way we see the, the rollout for, for pediatric GVHD. Beyond pediatric, uh, you know, the, the pediatric transplants account for about 25% of, of all bone marrow transplants uh, in the U.S. So clearly we, we have a major focus on the adult GVHD market as well, which obviously then is three times larger than the pediatric. Uh, and in order to address that patient population, we, we have a plan in place for a, a randomized controlled study in those patients with the most severe forms of the disease where existing therapies, the approved therapies, don't, don't um, do particularly well. And so the, our plan would be a head-to-head -head against best existing therapy uh, in order to expand the label from pediatric to adult. That'll be a stepwise progression. Uh, I think you also asked me, how do we see revenues coming in from some of the milestones around our phase three assets? Um, with respect to, to the back pain asset, we have a, a partnership with that anticipates uh, a positive readout and anticipates the, the commencement of um, a second phase three in in Europe. Uh, and both of those are linked to milestone payments um, based on uh, achieving those, those successful deliverables. And we expect that both of those um, would be um, would, would be milestones that we would see in the next over the next six months. Um, with respect to other milestones, we, we have certain milestones linked to our partnership with TASLI on on cardiovascular uh, outcomes such, such as positive results and approvals in the in the Chinese territory, and um, we uh, certainly intend to enter into new strategic partnerships um, for both the heart failure asset uh, globally uh, in, in the U.S. And, and other territories, as well as the back pain asset in the U.S. market, uh, are subject to positive readouts. And, um, and we are in discussions with other strategic partners in, in areas such as COVID-19 ARDS. Does that address um, your, your question? Please. Yes, thank you. And then just on the OPEX, how should we think about the year-over-year -year increase for R&D and SG&A, if there is any? Yeah. Josh, can I ask you to, to address that? Sure. Sure. So so uh, in this current year that just ended, we actually are not carrying anything under SG&A. Um, that, that will start to shift into that category as we have uh, sales revenue. Um, and you know we believe that we'll be able to have um, so so we'll be able to shift uh, some of the costs into a separate category. Right now, we've, we've been carrying it a bit in R and D, and that's why um, although I mentioned the trials uh, spend slowing down, if you look at the income statement in the press release, you see only about a three million dollar difference, three to four million dollar difference, and that's because some of the investment in commercial is, is sitting in there. It'll move to a separate category called SGNA. Manufacturing commercialization um, includes inventory until we have a high certainty of approval, and we're 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 confident. But from an accounting standard, we're we're not at that high certainty level. We are still expensing the uh, product that we're making for potential launch. That will be reversed and carried out to our balance sheet as inventory uh, with with a, with an approval. And so you'll see actually the manufacturing commercialization come down significantly and be more like 2019. There will still be spend, but it will be capitalized as inventory. Um, overall, okay, thank you Louise, for, yeah, so, so and, and overall, just um, uh, for the end of the uh, last quarter, we had a pro forma cash balance of about $150 million. Uh, we just reported a cash balance of 129.3. So use of about $20 million of cash uh, during the quarter, just over 20. There was um, a little bit of uh, revenue, a little bit of cash received um, from JCR. Um, but otherwise, you know, that, that's about the cash burn that we expect to see 
uh, for the coming quarter. Your next question comes from Jeffrey Cohen with Leidenberg Dahlman and Co. Incorporated. Please go ahead. Oh, hi, Sylvia, Josh, and Fred. How are you? Hi. Just a recap from last week as far as the uh, the ODAC panel on Ryan Software Adolescence. What was the average age of the treated patients? And I assume that was up to 12 or 14 in age, and it's sounding like the label would be up to 18. Could you just clarify that and talk about that for a moment, please? Yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to have uh, Dr. Fred Grossman address um, the details of the trial and uh, what we think may be in the label. Fred. Yeah. So the, the the label will follow the trial, and the trial enrolled patients up to and through the age of 17. Um, the the mean age was about uh, between five and seven. So. We, we, we enrolled the full gamut of the ages uh, in that study, and I expect that the label, if approved, will uh, will follow that pivotal trial. Okay, so you're expecting the label up to 18, as you referenced. Uh, that, that's what I would expect because it, it will follow the uh, the pivotal trial. Okay, and. Um, my second question, thanks for that. As a follow-up, as far as what you, what you found learning more about uh, the JCR experience and adults and children, as far as the composition of use, can you give us any flavor on the composition of use and uh, talk a little more about where they stand on production and backlog and then perhaps how that may relate to um, your uh, fiscal 2021 revenues as compared to 20. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I would say that, that we just don't have that information around the specifics uh, on use in children versus adults, um, number one. Number two, the details around backlog and, and strategic plans um, are something that are, are obviously um, JCRs, so, so you, I would refer you to their public statement at this point. But, um, Josh, perhaps you could address uh, the projected royalties that we expect in the next 12 months from Kimsell Sales. Sure. So, so, so JCR has put out um, some guidance for, 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 the, for their current fiscal year, which carries through to March 2021, that showed about a 30% drop in Kimsell sales was their expectation. Um, and then more recently, at the end of I think the end of July, early August, they published their first quarter results, and they actually exceeded their their estimate of a third drop, and they they dropped uh, about by by sixty some odd percent, sixty seven percent in temp cell sales for that quarter. Um, you know that's potentially impacted uh, by 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 reduction in in usage due to COVID, um, although. Um, I think it's it's largely driven by their restrictions around patient access, but um, you know we, we we're going with the one third um, as their sort of long term you know forecast the one third drop. Okay, got it. I'm going to squeeze in one more if I can as far as Grinton Paul and their phase three and your phase three readout. Is their trial going to be dependent on your phase three readout? Does it feel like they're going to pursue? and proceed regardless of the outcome, or is that going to be partly uh, based upon how your phase three reads out in the fourth quarter? Well, so I can, I can tell you that, that we're considering uh, a second, and we've spoken about this before, we've, we've considered that the second trial would have a 12-month primary endpoint, not a 24-month primary endpoint, right? And so the second trial is using the the twelve month component of the twenty four month overall outcome of the current trial to have a confirmatory two trial data set for both the European and the US regulators. Uh, and so really it's the it's the totality of the data that will come out in this current trial that will support the specifics of the second trial and those dis 
discussions are active and ongoing with the European regulators already. Um, and so, I, you know, more than that, I, I can't speak specifically for Grunthal. They're running their, their strategy and their program, but I would say that there are many components and considerations as to the second trial in Europe beyond simply um, yes or no on a, on a 24-month primary endpoint. Okay, got it. Thanks for taking questions. A lot going on between now and the end of the year. Thanks very much. Your next question comes from Tanner Shi Jane with Bell Potter Securities. Please go ahead. Hi, Sylvia, Josh, and Fred. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, and it truly was a monumental um, uh, milestone achieved for you guys in uh, this month. Um, just a couple of uh, Firstly, on the adult GVHD trial, I've got two questions in that. Anything that you can tell me about what that trial um, may look like in terms of sizing or cost? And the other thing, so you mentioned that we're really going to be focusing on the high-risk adults there. Um, can you perhaps talk to me about any biomarkers, et cetera, that you might use to actually select these patients? Yeah, it's a great, that's a great question. Um, I'll, I'll defer to Fred in terms of the thought process right now around specific patients, size, et cetera, which I think is probably a little bit early. But in terms of biomarkers, what I will say is that um, in the pediatric phase three trial, we've clearly identified um, in vivo biomarkers that, that are both um, reflective of the mechanism of action of the therapy that are being impacted um, over time. And secondly, um, validated biomarkers of disease severity that can, that can um, uh, stratify patients at baseline based on maximal unmet medical need and the worst possible survival. And in that type of stratification, we have seen that Remy stem cell was effective, at least in the children, so stratified uh, in, with acute GVHD. And those, those type of biomarkers are certainly going to be helping us in design um, the adult study. Brett, would you like to, to add to that? Yeah, sure. As mentioned before, uh, the unmet need in uh, these in adult patients is very considerable, especially in the severe severe uh, uh, steroid refractory uh, QGVHD patients. In particular, the treatments that are available have um, safety liabilities and toxicities. So we're moving into a population of great unmet need, and we'll be focusing on uh, those most um, severe patients, uh, those that have uh, stages C and D or three and four uh, who are steroid refractory, uh, QGVHD. As mentioned before, we'll be uh, doing a randomized placebo-controlled trial that compares um, uh, treatment of, you know, Remy stem cell to, you know, versus best available treatment. And um, we're in the process now of designing the trial. We look forward to having discussions with the FDA regarding that design. And so um, we're not disclosing at this point the, the size, but it'll be powered to detect a difference and to uh, allow us to extend the label into adults if positive. Right, and, and assuming you guys get approved and launch in the market in fourth quarter for pediatry, how soon do you think we're looking at starting an adult trial? Fred? Yeah, well, this is uh, this is imminent. You know, we're we're at this point designing the trial, and uh, the start date will really depend on the discussions we have with the FDA, so that we have complete agreement on the on the path forward. Right, and then um, just one last question on that: um, with the uh, adult trial cell view, what would be your preference? Uh, I guess to go market strategy. Um, would you consider going direct as you're doing for pediatric, or would you consider um, involving a partner there? No, no, for, for the adult GVSD market? Yeah. No, I think we're, we're 
we are, have embarked on a clear strategy. We've built out a, a, a commercial team um, that that's being led internally by Eric Strati, and then we've recently um, appointed a new COO, Dag, Dagmar Bjorksen, who will lead our overall strategy uh, and, and business unit growth. And uh, this is the adult GVHD is part of that whole strategy. Uh, pediatric and adult market, we will we will build our own on our own. Great. Um, and just a question in terms of the COVID nineteen trial, um, can you perhaps tell me how many of the uh, thirty sites are already recruiting patients? Fred. Yeah, I mean, all, all of the sites are recruiting patients, but as you know, there are hot spots around the country, and that's why we're focusing on all of the regions uh, because those hot spots uh, change. So uh, clearly, in the southeast uh, and the west, uh, during these these last peak times, we were uh, recruiting uh, primarily in those areas, in those regions. But now things are starting to. Uh, to bump up in the Midwest, and uh, unfortunately, I suspect that things will start to uh, increase in the Northeast as well. So we're covering all of the regions um, at this point. And you're happy with the rate of the enrollment? Yes, we're, we're on track as expected at this point. Great. That's all for me. Thank you. Thank you. Next question comes from Jason Colbert with Dawson James. Please go ahead. Hi, guys. Congratulations on all the progress. I'd just like to ask a little bit about the powering assumptions and the effect size assumed in the COVID trial. Thanks. Fred, would you like to take that question? Yeah. So I think as mentioned before, uh, the mortality rate remains high despite some of the advances and changes in the way patients are treated once on vent, uh, ventilation. They're still ranging from 60 to 80 percent. Uh, we've assumed a uh, very conservative uh, mortality rate for the uh, control group of uh, m much lower than that. So it's powered based on that, and uh, we're powered to uh, uh, 90 percent, between 80 and 90 percent. It's powered to uh, allow us to get this uh, an indication if uh, if we succeed at the end of the trial. It's a very efficient trial, and it also uh, that efficiency allows us to do the interim analyses. Sorry, I was really looking for the effect size in those calculations. Yeah, so um, I think we have, you're, you're, yeah, you're we asking have, for a lot, a lot of detail, which I don't think is something that we've previously yeah. made public. But I think what, what Fred is saying that obviously if the mortality rate in the controls is between 60 to 80 percent, then, you know, you can simply look at our pilot data where we had a something like a 20 percent mortality. Uh, and you can make your own assessment of what the delta um, could be used to power such a study. What Fred is saying is that it's well and truly strongly powered, given the very conservative uh, approach to what we think the, the controls are likely to be. But is that correct, Fred? Yes. That is. Well, I, I understand what you're saying, but without, I'm sure you're not assuming the effect size that you saw in the pilot study, if you will, but what I think you're saying is that you're assuming a much more conservative effect size and a very conservative control rate, so you're powered for that delta, so if you come anywhere near what you saw in the pilot program, it would be a home run. Is that fair? I, I would say that's very fair. Yeah, and I, and I think not only, not only is that fair, I think Thanks. that if we were to see the kind of data that we saw in the pilot we would not need anywhere near 300 patients to succeed, right? We, we would, we, a fraction of that 300 patient number would be what would be needed to show a significant outcome. So, Silvio, given the number of therapeutics that are in development, how do you zero out for all of the 
those different therapeutics across the control arm. And second part is on good data, what happens given project warp speed and the U.S. government's, you know, intense focus on it, on the acquisition of product? Well, I, I, I would say that you know, both the control and the treatment arms are being offered every available standard therapy that's being used. And I, I would expect right now that most patients who are on ventilators would have been exposed to steroids and probably remdesivir, right? Those are used more, most broadly. Despite that, um, in most recent publications out of the U.S., uh, the mortality rate appears to have remained a constant 60 to 80 percent in patients who are of the severity that are being enrolled in this trial. And that, that makes us very comfortable that despite new changes in, in therapeutics, they're evenly balanced between the treatment and, and control arms. Um, the, the, the second question you're asking is what, what is likely to happen should the results be positive, I think, of the trial. So we see that the, the potential approval for GVHD supports the, the, um, the initial label of the product, and it's built around a very large safety database. Um, should the COVID-19 trial also be positive, you know, several months thereafter, for example, um, you know, we would leverage the extensive safety database of Remy Stem Cell um, for GVHD and be in discussions with the agency around a potential label extension for COVID-19. Um, if we were in that position, we then have to be prepared to substantially scale up manufacturing, which is what we currently um, have invested in and are currently investing in, to be in a position next year to make sufficient quantity of product to start to meet some of this, um, the unmet need. And really, the, the unmet need is dependent, obviously, on, on the success or otherwise of, of the vaccines at the front end. Uh, I think if, if, if there's a successful one or more, more vaccines, uh, as we all hope there will be, then really the incidence of, of patients getting infected or the proportion of patients progressing to um, requiring ventilation will, will become more manageable. Uh, we, we are planning for, obviously, a long-term th therapy for patients with viral-induced ARDS. Uh, today, the, the number of patients who die from influenza-related ARDS in ICUs across the U.S. is around 60 to 70,000 patients a year. That's a very large number. Uh, and if we overlay on top of that a steady state number from COVID-19, that, that provides us with a, you know, a substantial market opportunity but also a substantial challenge for our rapid scale-up in manufacturing. And that's exactly what we're working towards. Yeah, good problems. To yeah, have. I would Congratulations. like to add. Yeah, I would just add that um, th this trial, uh, before initiating it, uh, was based on discussions uh, with, with the FDA. So I would fully expect that if we had a positive outcome, we would move forward with uh, with an indication. Your next question comes from Swayamthila Ramakant with HC Rainwhite and Co. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, this is Orke from HC Rainwright. Um, uh, good, good, uh, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, MISC, uh, I mean, it's great that you have established an EAP and have actually, you know, um, a, a successful uh, first patient. Um, so, how should we think about the progression on on this indication? Um, do you um, should we assume you're going to do something similar to what you did with the adult patients in the sense uh, look at like the first dozen or so patients and see where the data falls um, and progress from there? Um, I'm just trying to, trying to understand you know what could be a potential timeline for this to become a real indication for you for you and. Uh, on top, uh, additionally, you know, with the with the with the current um, data that you have, 
in the pediatric patients um, with the um, acute GVHD, is there anything that you can draw from the anti-inflammatory properties um, that you see in the acute GVHD into the MASC? Yeah, these, these are great questions. Okay, thank you very much. Re- really important question. So, um, first of all, we extensive safety database in children um, having, having treated something like at least several hundred children or at least a thousand overall patients with steroid refractory GVHD. But the database in safety in children is unique in terms of the extent of any therapeutic in, in this large patient population with severe inflammatory disease. Um, the mechanism of action of our cells in, in acute GVHD is the use of surface receptors to sense high levels of inflammatory cytokines and the ability of our cells then to, to dampen down the cytokine storm by switching off the, the production of these cytokines by the inciting inflammatory cells. That, that's a mechanism that we think um, is, is, is pervasive and, and present in the setting of COVID-19, both ARDS and the more systemic manifestations that involve vascular inflammation and cardiovascular complications, renal, CNS complications. What happens, particularly in these children with multi-system disorder, is that they don't necessarily have such a big problem with the lungs and, in fact, seem to clear the virus better than adults do but then develop an autoimmune process that is due to to excessive cytokine production and inflammation of multiple vessels in various organs. And the heart is very significantly involved in 50% of the cases. Um, And so since the mechanisms appear to be quite similar between systemic GVHD involving the gut and liver and systemic COVID-19 involving major organs, we think that if we're able to get the cells delivered to those sites of inflammation, they can respond in a similar way and hopefully uh, result in similar beneficial outcomes. So I think with respect to the MIS-C children, you're quite right. We, we are collecting a, a, you know, an initial group of children who would be treated under the EAP. We will be reviewing um, both the safety but more importantly the, the efficacy if we see it. Uh, and that's fairly easy to read out. These, these children have a requirement to, to have cardiac dysfunction. And so if we see cardiac functional recovery that is rapid and that leads to discharge home, it'll be quite, quite evident in a very short amount of time. Um, and I, I guess how we would then be in a position to um, have a, th- a therapy for a, a larger population would be a, a discussion that we'd want to have with the agency around what, what kind of um, pivotal studies need to be in place to support the use of the cells more broadly beyond the initial FDA approval for, uh, for these children at high risk. Fred, do you have anything else that you'd like to add to this? Yeah, I would add, uh, look, given our uh, mission uh, in, in treating those most severe patients where there's an unmet need, uh, this certainly meets that definition. There, there are no t- available, um, you know, modern treatments for these patients. They're usually given uh, IVIG and steroids, and um, you know, sometimes it works. But in in this case, because this is affecting uh, the myocardium, and uh, these kids are getting pericarditis, myocarditis, and uh, have vascular components, uh, this, is, this is a problem. And uh, the larger problem is that now with schools opening, I think many hospitals are expecting to see more cases. So we're making our cells available based on everything that was just mentioned in terms of the mechanism of action. And as noted, we're monitoring safety and, of course, efficacy. And uh, based on those signals, uh, we'll determine uh, what the next steps are. Uh, can, uh, for a, as a follow-up, you know, in, in the patient, uh, in the kid that uh, was reported, um, 
uh, obviously it, he um, had a severe uh, cardiac function issue. Um, but, you know, based on the definition of the syndrome, it could be any other system. Was anything else affected for this patient? And also, what do you think, um, you know, uh, renal stem cell could do if, if it is not the, not the cardiac tissue, but if it's something else like the liver or the kidney, uh, could you, you know, are you including such patients in the EAP or is it only the patients who have a cardiac uh, issue? No, I, well, we are focusing on the cardiac issue. Uh, and many of these patients have cardiac uh, as, as well as uh, liver, you know, kidney at times. Uh, it can also affect the brain. So what, what do we expect the cells to do? We expect the cells to perform the same way that they did in GVHD, which also can have multiple organs uh, involved. So I would expect that uh, we would see improvement um, if, if other organs are, are involved. But we're focusing on the uh, cardiac involvement because these are the most severe uh, cases, uh, some of whom, uh, you know, are in the ICU, some of whom wind up on mechanical ventilation. Uh, in, in the last large cohort that occurred in the U.S., there were 20 percent were on mechanical ventilation and 2 percent died. And these are otherwise healthy children. So uh, in answer to your question, we're focusing on um, uh, cardiac involvement uh, because that's the area of greatest need. And if there were other organs involved, and sometimes there are, we would expect that Remy stem cell uh, uh, could have the potential to uh, uh, reduce the inflammation in those organs as well. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for taking my questions. Thanks. That brings us to the end of today's call. I'll now hand back to Dr. Atescu for closing remarks. Right. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for joining this call. It's been a, a very important year for us that we've just reported on, but I think the next few months are going to be momentous for the company, and uh, we look forward to updating everybody in due course. Thank you.